So anyway, we, last week we started a new series of Conversations with Jesus, and we're going to look at, uh, through the Gospels, the different uh, encounters that Jesus has with, with real people, and, um, and what we can learn about him, and about ourselves, and about life from, from the conversations, right? And so um, today I want you to look at um, Luke um, chapter 19. Uh, first couple of verses, and uh, and this is a very familiar story. In fact, it's one that a couple of years ago, Jana preached on this. Um, I thought she did it a few weeks ago, but she said no, it was actually a couple of years ago. So <laughs> I guess I guess I'm free to do it too. Uh, Jesus entered Jericho, Luke 19, and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down now. Uh, I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. They must have been church folk, you know, that's when the muttering really gets going. Um, uh, and they began to mutter, um, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay him back four times that amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation's come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. So Lord, we pray that you would teach us from your word, from this conversation, from this encounter, and, uh, and may we uh, grow to follow you and allow you into our lives in the process. That's our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. So the question today is, do people change? Do they change? Um, I asked uh, a couple sitting here that'll go nameless, <laughs> Alice and Jerry, and uh, <laughs> Alice at the same time, almost uh, simultaneously, Jerry goes, no, and Alice goes, yes, they change <laughs> together. I thought, okay, there's marriage counseling in their future, you know, right, right there. Um, how many of you think that people can change? Yeah. Oh, what a positive, good group you are. That's good. Anybody here think that people can't really change? They just become more than. <laughs> well, let me come down and sit with you because you know the two of us see reality. You know, yeah. <laughs> we're not in some fantasy. Well, yeah, that's an interesting thing because um, I flip flopped on this one. Uh, I, I, most of my life, I believe that people are the way they are, and they just get more that way. So people who are a little crabby and stuff, when they get older, they're really crabby. And, and people who are um, loving and kind and generous, the older they get, the more loving and kind and generous they get. But you know, after having spent a lifetime with uh, people from all different backgrounds, you know, as a pastor, um, I sometimes question that because I've actually seen some people change along the way radically and sometimes it's a it's an immediate change like we see here in, in Luke uh, 19 with with uh, Zacchaeus uh, very dramatic very sudden and then for others it's maybe a slow evolving to a new new place and uh, I want to believe that people can change um, I have to fight my own realism, you know, uh, pessimism, negativity. I have to, I have to fight that uh, because I want to believe that I can change, really. Um, and uh, that I can become more of what God made me to be rather than what I've sort of become out of survival instinct, you know, uh, as we use. Um, so uh, when we look at this passage with Zacchaeus, you know, I've always, you know, every every Bible lesson and Sunday school lesson always focused on his height. And th there's only three things we know about him, really. He was a tax, the chief tax collector. He was rich and he was short. So that's all we know. Um, and, um, and then Jesus comes and calls him by name and tells him to get out of the tree and 
host him at the at the house. And we see the, the crowd going, not him. <laughs> Don't go to his house. Oh my gosh. This guy is terrible. He's horrible. He's ruined our lives. Uh, he's just brutal. And uh, why would Jesus go there? He must not know better. We better tell him. And uh, so I'm thinking about this. And I'm going, if this is a conversation Jesus is having with, with Zach, you know, um, how would he know his name? And Zacchaeus said he wanted to see Jesus. He'd never seen him before. And so he goes on up the road and he climbs up in the fig tree so he could get a view. And Jesus walks by and says, hey, Zacchaeus, hey, come on down. I'm going to your house. Well, I don't even know he had a house. How do you know he could provide for everybody in the entourage and all that? What? Doesn't that ever strike you as odd? It, it, it's always kind of struck me as weird. Um, although I say often in the worship service, you know, God knows you, he made you, he calls you by name, right? And, uh, and we believe that, so why wouldn't he? But then I thought maybe there's another answer. Now, I could be wrong about this, okay? So I'm going to put that out there. I could be wrong. But as I'm looking at this, I was reading ahead, and uh, I mean, reading back one, one chapter to sort of ramp up on 19. So I was looking at 18, and I thought it's an interesting thing. Jesus is telling a uh, sermon illustration, a parable. And now I know as a preacher that sermon illustrations, they don't come from the internet, eh? <laughs> at least good ones don't, and, and uh, they don't come from illustration books. You know where they come from? Walking around, talking with y'all, and listening, and seeing what's going around, and then sharing it with you. This is what I saw, you know, in life, and, and that's basically what a sermon illustration is. You're getting a little class here in homiletics. And, uh, and I thought, well, Jesus probably did the same thing. You know, the parables were probably based on things that he saw and experienced, right? And so, is it too far of a stretch? Um, I'm looking at just the chapter just before this, and Jesus... Uh, uh, says, uh, to those who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. I'm a tither. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other one, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I'm looking at that, just the, the page before Jesus' experience with Zacchaeus. And I'm starting to think, I wonder if Jesus hadn't seen Zacchaeus at prayer and heard him say, uh, I don't belong here. I don't, I don't belong here. I'm a sinner. I need mercy. God, I need mercy. I got nothing to stand on. Have mercy on me, a sinner. So when Jesus is walking along and he sees Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector up in the tree, it's not a stretch for me to think, hey, you wanted mercy. You're the one who prayed that God would have mercy on you. Well, Today you get mercy. Come on down out of your tree. We're coming to your house. Salvation's coming to your house today. Now, I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. I just look at that and go, I could, I could see that happening. And, um, and I wonder if Zacchaeus, when he, if he was, that was him at prayer saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm wondering if he ever believed that that would actually really happen. 
Would that really happen? Or was it more of a cry of hopelessness? Could his life really change? Could there be a difference in his life tangibly? Could he become uh, free and, uh, and a whole person? By God's grace, could he? Well, you know, instinctively, I want to say probably not because, um, you know, we all live in an environment. Anybody here live like in a family or a neighborhood or a, a church group or anything like that? Some of you do. Okay. So, you know, that people have expectations of you based on what you've done or what you've been or, or situations you've had with them, right? People know you that way and they relate to you that way. Um, you know, there's people who uh, probably have some attitude about me or that I have attitude about them and we relate a certain way based on something that, that happened long ago that we don't even remember, but we just keep going back to that. And, and pretty soon, have you ever noticed you go to a family reunion and, and when, when my folks were alive, we'd, we'd, we'd go in and pretty soon I was like 13 years old again. I was, you know, I was a little Johnny with trouble in his mouth and competing with the brothers and, blah, 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 and, and uh, never really quite fitting in. And, and I go, well, how did I become the kid all over again? Whew. I could be extremely middle aged and go home and be like a little kid, you know. Um, and sometimes we don't let people change. We don't have room in our hearts and in our lives to accept change in people around us. We want them to be in their place. You know, one of the things that, that we've been learning in the, in the recovery process is that when, when the problem person gets clean and sober, guess who is upset? All the family members around them, all their circle of friends, because now they're not being the way they're supposed to be that always fit in, and then it means everybody else is going to have to change, right? That happens all the time. And uh, I'm actually deciding today that I, I believe that change can happen. That's big for me as a committed negative person. Now, so looking at Zacchaeus, he has this, uh, two things he does besides having Jesus over the house. So uh, the first thing he does is he... Um, He's going to pay everybody he defrauded, you know, and as a tax collector, he was a scoundrel. He was the chief scoundrel. He was, he was the head honcho of scoundreling and, uh, and cheating. So he, so he said, everybody I defrauded, I'm going to pay back four times. I thought, wow, that's really generous, right? So historians, scholars tell us that actually that was the, that was the standard penalty for fraud. That was the legal penalty. You pay back four times what you defrauded. So he was basically not being generous. He was basically saying, I'll pay, I'll pay my, my dues, right? But then he said, I'll take half of what I have and I'll give that to the poor. Now that actually was an offering. That, that wasn't just paying the dues. That was now a, a sign of a transformation. And, uh, and it's interesting that when Jesus comes into his life, he has to do some tangible things to express his change. It's not just a spiritual reality for him. It has to be a tangible get up and do something um, to demonstrate the change. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a lifetime talking to people about inviting Jesus into their lives and, and encouraging them to do that, and sometimes telling them they're not ready, so not, not to do it. But um, those who begin to act on their new relationship with Christ often carry that forward into the rest of their life. Those who have a spiritual experience, have a conversion experience, and don't do anything tangibly, it drifts away. Uh, my life is filled with friends who drifted away, you know, of, uh, from the Lord. And, I, and they were so, they had such a dramatic conversion and then, because there, there was no tangible demonstration of Jesus' presence and power at work in them. And so for, for Zacchaeus to, to come out and say, okay, I'm, I'm acting on this. I'm acting on this right now. It was a sign of the change. And uh, so, 
You know, it's funny, and Eileen and I were talking last night about her paternal grandfather, who for most of his life was a mean, hard, rough, rugged North Dakota farmer slash gold miner. And uh, a very unlikable person. And her father escaped the farm and escaped him by joining the Marines because it was so much easier. <laughs> it was like, oh, this life is great. Whoa. <laughs> and, but she said that uh, later in his life, he actually met Jesus and went through a tangible change. And the meanness went away and the hardness and he became a, a kind and loving a person in, the, in later years in his life. So I know that that change could happen. You know, we, we see it and we, and we claim that uh, in Jesus' name. Um, but what makes it so hard for us to change? What makes it so hard for us to allow uh, Jesus to come into our life, into our uh, world, into our house, and have his way with us so that we become transformed? What, what makes that so hard to change? I think the answer is shame. I think it's shame. Um... Damien and I have a, a favorite movie that uh, Anthony Hopkins said it was the most important movie he's ever made in his life, and his favorite movie. It's called The Edge. Nobody's ever seen it but Damien and I. <laughs> but we've seen it enough to, to account for the average viewing. So uh, that's good, uh, the average global viewing. But it's basically, you know, Anthony Hopkins is a very, very wealthy, wealthy individual who's off on an expedition in the woods and gets lost. The plane crashes and they're being killed by a bear, their team, and it's down to him and, and one other person. And the other person is giving up. And so there's this great scene where Anthony Hopkins looks at him. Uh, who's the actor? Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Uh, Alec Baldwin played Bob. And uh, he looked at him and Bob's giving up. He's, he's had it. Just sit down and die. And so Anthony Hopkins asked, Bob, why do men die in the woods? Why do they die in the woods? And Alec Baldwin goes, I don't know. I don't know. He goes, they die of shame. How could I have gotten into this mess? Why didn't I prepare better? Why didn't I take precautions? Why wasn't I smart enough to fi figure this out? And the shame comes over. The, how will I face anybody? How will I face the families of the people who died around me? Uh, I, I can't take this. And so they just hunker down in shame and die in the woods. And I think that's what was happening with Zacchaeus. Except for one thing. He knew he was a sinner. He knew it. Throughout uh, Luke's gospel, there's Jesus is having fights with the, with the Pharisees, the religious people, the confident ones. They says confident of their own righteousness, you know, and he's having these battles with them and they have no shame. See? They have no shame. There's no, uh, they have no problem because it's always somebody else's problem. So there's nothing to repent of. But for Zacchaeus saying, I know everybody hates me. I know I've defrauded everybody. I know that I'm the, the, the worst one around and I can't even get, the crowd won't even let me through. Uh, all I can do is go up the road and climb a tree. That's all I got left. Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. So as soon as we acknowledge our need for salvation, our need for grace, we become free of the shame. The spell of the shame is broken. The chains of the shame is broken. It begins with that acknowledgement. There's a, a quote, I was trying to find it this week and I couldn't find it, so I, don't, I can't tell you who it is, but this is basically what it was. That 
The condition of humanity is sin. Sin is our inability to admit we have it. Inability to admit we're sinners. That's our problem. So everybody sins, but the sin is we don't admit it. So therefore there can be no change. There can be no healing. There can be no hope. There can be no grace. There can be no redemption. There can be no salvations come to this house today because we don't have a problem. We don't, we don't have a need. Well, I want to encourage you to be like Zacchaeus and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Because then when God's merciful to us, we see it, we recognize it, and we take hold of it and we go, wow, I am so grateful. I, I need mercy. I need grace. I need forgiveness. I need, I need the Lord in my life. Because on my own, I'm just me. And that's not that good. Um, what am I... Uh, I think I've to, I must have told you this story. Uh, years ago when I was here in Seattle serving, uh, there was a young man um, who was, I was kind of jealous of him. He, he had, was, had the perfect life. He drove a yellow Porsche of all things. And he was a young guy in his 20s and he was manager of a, uh, of a international oceanic company, um, a French company that, anyway, it was, he had everything going. And uh, it was really good, and, and it was a, a person of faith. And um, and uh, one night he knocked on our door uh, over in Edmonds, and and he came in and he said that his father had died, and and because he's the only Christian in the family, he, he's supposed to the family's expecting him to do the uh, funeral because all of his brothers and everybody are drug farmers up and down the West Coast. So I said, oh, that's an interesting career path, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so I said, well, that's great, you know, that you're doing that. And he said, well, I need some help because um, I went to the funeral home and they asked me about my dad and was he in any organizations, you know, Kiwanis or Rotary and stuff. And I said, well, he was the treasurer of the Oakland Hells Angels. <laughs> now, this was back when the Hells Angels were tough, you know, and, uh, and I went, you're kidding me. No way. He goes, oh, well, actually he was, and my, my parents got divorced, and so he'd have custody in the summer. So as a kid, I'd ride on the back of his chopper up through Northern California, drug runs and gun runs, and, and then he would uh, launder the money and all those things and handle all the money for him. And that was the way I grew up through junior high and high school you know, as a kid. And he said, I was, I was with my dad before he died uh, the last few weeks. And, uh, and I was sitting there with him and I asked him if he had any regrets. And he said, I only have one. I've been a bad father. I have not passed on to you the values I should have passed on. I've not been there for you. And so you've had to make your own way. And he said, my biggest disappointment in life, my biggest regret is that you became a Christian. I failed. Because you became a Christian. And Dell was like, whoa, really? Um, and so they, he kept visiting his dad. Uh, and, and he said that uh, a few nights before his dad died, he sat there and prayed that Christ would come into his life. His dad did, made a big confession, and, um, and died a follower of Jesus. And Dell said, I couldn't believe that his biggest disappointment in life was that I became a Christian, that I'd let him down, and he, he'd let me down, that I would do that. But he said, I saw my dad changed before his death. And I've always remembered that conversation that night and thought, you know, nobody is beyond the reach of grace and Jesus and the life he has for us. Even a lifetime of pushing God away can stop and we can say, Lord, come into my life. Have your way in me. And it may disappoint some people around us. But God wants to have their life too. 
and he might use us to reach them. So can people change? No. Can Jesus change people? Yes. And that's the point. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Today, Zacchaeus, salvation's come to your house. You're getting mercy today. You can change. So well, that's our conversation today. So let's pray. Lord, you call us out of our own trees that we're sitting in sometimes, hiding away, trying to get a look at you from afar, but not let you affect us. But Lord, we pray that you'd call us out. That you would come into our lives and our hearts and our minds and bring your changing mercy and grace and bring your healing from our shame and set us free. We need you so much and we don't want to die in the woods. So lead us day by day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.